Hello, everybody. It's a great honor to participate in the virtual summit hosted by the National Foreign Language Center. My name is Mariana Bostevanova. I teach French and linguistics at Arizona State University. Today, I'll be sharing ideas about using games to develop L2 communication skills. Here is a brief overview of my presentation. First, I will outline the benefits and challenges of using games in the language classroom. Next, I will share strategies and tips for successful implementation of games. And at the end, I will provide examples of games that I have been successfully using in my classes. I hope you will be able to update your teacher toolbox with some new ideas, strategies. So what are the benefits of using games? Play is our brain's favorite way of learning. In addition, in language classes, games provide an interactive and learner-centered environment. They create a meaningful context for language use and help the development of communicative competence. So what is communicative competence? Those are the strategies speakers use when they encounter problems in the process of conveying information. For example, they might use circumlocution, synonyms, gestures, uh, follow-up questions, etc. Game promote the spontaneous use of the second language. They increase learners' motivation, reduce anxiety, and develop creativity. So what are some of the challenges? If games are poorly designed or poorly implemented, they can be a waste of class time, no matter how exciting and fun they are. Games might also be time consuming and hard to manage. Sometimes it's hard to keep all students on task or provide feedback. Another challenge is the use of L1. When students are excited about the game or when they have lexical gaps, they might start using English. Another potential issue is related to mismatches in competing teams. And lastly, some adult learners might not take games seriously unless they understand the linguistic objective and the benefits of the game for the development of their L2 skills. In order to overcome these challenges, we need a deliberately crafted design and careful implementation. We need effective strategies. Sometimes making small changes in the design or the implementation of the game can transform it into highly enjoyable and energizing language practice. Now let's look at some strategies and tips. Game design and implementation procedures are crucial if we want to create optimal conditions and maximize proficiency gains. I start with the game objective, which is part of the overall lesson objective. Then I make decisions about the design and implementation of the game. As for the game design, I always start with the outcome. Then I think about the rules. I create a sequence and build in the linguistic support. The gamification of language practice activities makes them highly enjoyable and engaging. So what are some of the game elements and techniques that can transform language practice activities into an exciting and energizing game? Competition, teams, elements of chance, awards, badges, levels of difficulty, so students get the sense of progression, a limited number of lifelines or hints or clues to help them when they're stuck and to decrease the anxiety level, a limited number of lives, this is the num uh, number of incorrect answers without penalty, etc. We don't need to use all of these elements and techniques but we have to think and decide which ones could be useful in order to optimize the learning conditions. Now, I would like to share with you how I use games in my classes. I have found that organizing a game tournament over the course of a week or two weeks or a certain number of class periods can be very, very appealing to students and very motivating. I don't spend the entire class period playing games. Instead, I create short 10 to 20 minute competition events, which are part of an ongoing game tournament. Learners usually play a game at the end of each class. I use strategic grouping when I assign players to teams, but then students have to come up with a name, motto, mascot, colors for their team. This process in itself is a form of language learning and practice because they have to do some research, negotiate with their teammates, and make a decision as a group while speaking the target language. It is a highly enjoyable process because competitors have to create their team's identity and present it to the class. And learners are looking forward to the next tournament event 
and there is a lot of excitement and anticipation. So it's quite, it's a very successful format. Next, I would like to discuss time management, which represents one of our biggest challenges. Time is our most precious resource. So how do we make every minute count and how do we make every learner engaged? Here are several tips. My first tip is time games whenever possible. It's better to offer a time activity than wait for everybody to finish the game. Let me give you two examples. First example, instead of telling your students, find five things you and your teammates have in common, tell them the following. You have five minutes to find things in common with your teammates. The team with the longest list wins. The activity is now put in a competition format and during the five minutes, everybody is actively speaking, trying to come up with more similarities because they want to win. Another example was with the lie detector game, or it's also known two truths and a lie. Instead of telling your students, write two truths and a lie, and the class will guess which, one's, which one is the lie, tell your students the following. You have five minutes to write a list of true and false statements about yourself. You can limit the statements about a specific topic, for example, about your family, about the summer, about an article the students just read, etc. Mark true or false next to each statement. You get a point for each statement. Then you have five minutes to share with a partner. You get a point if your partner doesn't guess correctly. Your partner gets three points for every correct guess. You're encouraged to ask follow-up questions when you're guessing. Here is the trick. Students get three points for guessing correctly. Now they're more motivated to have an incentive to ask follow-up questions and engage into a questioning and interrogation-like process, which actually develops their interpersonal communication skills. After that, they switch roles. Each partner gets five minutes to guess. By asking students to write not only true but false statements within a timed context, we, we're increasing their productivity because they can say anything they know how to say as long as they know really how to say it, regardless of whether it's true or false. This activity is very easy. This is a very low prep game that you can use at any level and for a wide range of topics. I use it probably at least five times during the semester with different topics and for different you know, purposes. Another challenge we deal with during games is the use of L1. How to stop the use of English during game time? I use the technique of the safety pins borrowed from baby showers. Each participant starts the game with five safety pins. If a student uses English, a classmate who overhears them will ask them for one of their pins. The contestant who finishes the class with the most pins wins an award. Students are policing themselves and playing actually another game at the same time uh, while they're also collecting safety pins from students who speak English. Don't use this technique too often though. Students will get used to it if you overuse it. Also, sometimes instead of safety pins, I use clothes pins, can, uh, candies, post-it notes, buttons, etc. to make it more exciting. Another way of reducing the use of English is by providing the linguistic support necessary not only for the game itself, but for the interpersonal communication which happens during the game. I provide students with a list of expressions necessary for interpersonal communication uh, during the game. For example, rephrasing, what I want to say, I mean, discourse markers, like sadly, fortunately, markers like expressions for agreement and disagreement, like I disagree, uh, or what do you think? I provide a variety of expressions with the same function. For example, for the lie detector game, I would give them you're a liar or you're a big fat liar. This is a lie. This is not true, etc. 
I give them charts, vocabulary lists, cheat sheets, etc. In addition, I award bonus points if during the game participants use a new expression, which I call the bonus expression for today's game. The students are more motivated to use the new expression because they are awarded additional points. For example, the bonus expression for today's game is, I'm not so sure. This way I provide incentives for students to use new expressions instead of relying on expressions they already know, such as I don't know. When I go around the class and hear them use I'm not so sure, I award a bonus point to the team. And this works. Students are aware of this easy way of getting an extra point and they keep repeating the expression, which is always a relatively new word or phrase, when they see me around. So it is a pretty um, successful, I think, way of making them use a new phrase or expression. Here are some more tips. Add levels of difficulty, levels level one, level two, level three, and increase the challenge and the points for each new level. Include time for practice. Like sports teams need to practice and strategize before the game, our students also need time to go over the rules, uh, maybe uh, strategize, review some of the vocabulary they will need or the structures, and talk to their teammates before they start the real game. That really improves the efficiency of the game if they have the time to speak English, ask questions, and strategize right before the game starts. If appropriate, use lifelines or clues or hints. This gives students the opportunity to get help when they don't know the answer. For example, give them three lifelines. Ask a classmate, ask the teacher, ask the team. Or two lifelines. Look it up, skip the question, etc. Provide lives. This is a limited number of incorrect answers that they're allowed to have with no penalty. Assign students' roles. For example, referees, scores scorekeepers, quiz masters, etc. Ask students to create quiz questions for the game they will play the next day. They love that. And lastly, do not grade games or because grades spoil the fun. They'll ruin the fun. I usually give them participation points. They play games for something very different than grading. My last tip is related to resources. There are tons of free and paid PowerPoint templates, charts, sheets on the web. I recommend a blog which offers a rich collection of free animated PowerPoint templates ready to use for a lot of the popular games. You just have to replace the text and images with your own. Um, it's called technologic.wordpress.com. Another good source is the site teachers pay teachers, but there you have to pay and you pay usually per game or per template. Uh, so, for example, I use some of the PowerPoint templates, but I change the rules or the text or the images. For example, I'll show you the spinning wheel or the wheel of fortune, which you can use for topic choices, for team names, for points and for many other reasons. And there are several templates that are free um, there. When I work on a game I'm going to use, I have a checklist that helps me decide what I need. Sometimes just going over the checklist, I come, with, come up with new ideas and make changes to something that I've already done. Uh, this is the list. It includes elements and techniques that we have already discussed. And um, you have to remember that even the best designed collaborative game can be diminished by poor procedure and implementation. So it's very important to think uh, and rethink the implementation strategies, you know, and the design to make sure that we optimize the learning process. And now it's showtime. Let's see how it all works and take a look at some other games I have been using regularly in my classes. I already told you about the lie detector game. It's a guessing game about true and false statements created by students. 
Another variation of this game is when the teacher tells or reads a short story and students get together their teams and decides which facts in the story are true and which ones are false. They're allowed to ask questions and then they get a point for every correct guess. So again, they have to discuss, they have to remember the story and then have to ask me follow-up questions. I usually tell them a short story about myself but I include a lot of inaccuracies, so they have to guess. And I'd only share things that I com I'm comfortable sharing. Or I use stories from the news that I, simp uh, that, that I simplify and I can make some changes. Some lies are very obvious. For example, I'll tell them, this morning I read a story about a boy who lives in Casablanca, the capital of Tunisia. Well, Casablanca is not in Tunisia and it is not a capital either. And students already know that because we've discussed Francophone Africa. So this actually is not that time consuming if you think about it. And students really enjoy it because now they have to actually write down what they remember from the story and then um, discuss together whether they think that the fact is accurate or not. Another type of games that I uh, use regularly are memory games. They're great for practicing descriptions. Students have to look at an image for a short period of time, and then they have to describe it by memory. They describe pictures, portraits, famous paintings, movie posters or scenes, advertising images, cartoons, etc. The principle is simple. It is always in teams, so they can discuss, compare their memories, and, you know, uh, talk to each other. It's always the same. And I usually include several levels of difficulties. First, I look at the image for 10, 15 seconds. It depends on the image. Then they have a minute to work individually. Very important because I don't want them to uh, start talking right after that. They need the time to just jot down what they remember. And then they get together in teams of three or four and work with their teammates and write a detailed description. They discuss the description orally, but they have to write it down and I use Google Docs so everybody can contribute. The team with the most detailed description wins. They get a point for every single detail, for every single word practically they use, like the color of the apples, the position of the object, uh, adjectives describing mental states, physical appearance, numbers, adverbs. The more language they produce in their description, the higher the score. Then we compare the descriptions in class, but I collect and grade them after class and announce the winner the next day. Uh, you can use memory games at any level. It can be as simple as showing them a picture of fruits, a room, famous paintings, a movie poster, or a scene or cartoon. But what they like the most is the photo flash. That's an activity that I borrowed from technologic.wordpress.com that displays a series of images in quick succession and then students have to describe all six photos by memory. You can do it at different speed rates, like slow, medium, fast, if you just press a button to determine how quickly the students see your images. Students love it, and as I said, I use it as the last level and triple the points for this round. You can also play memory games with oral stories or story listening, or you can also do it with short videos. This is how it works. The teacher reads a short story twice. Students are not allowed to take notes because it's a memory game. Then they have five minutes to write down what they remember individually, and then they discuss their notes with their teammates and create one complete story. The closer their story to the original one, the higher their score is. The more detailed their story is, again, the higher the score as well. I, again, I use Google Docs for this purpose and I award bonus points for new target structures and new vocabulary whenever that's appropriate. If you find a good story or if you tell them a good story, students actually really enjoy that reconstruction of the story. Sometimes they 
uh, they're surprised how much they remember or how like they have different memories they don't remember some details or they didn't understand some of the details so they help each other when they compare their notes and it's actually a lot of communication a lot of comprehension and um it is extremely highly rated especially when you find a good story or if you tell them a good story the next thing i call how well do you know me it is inspired by the newlyweds tv game the teacher prepares a list of, a list of questions in advance for example what is your favorite place to eat? Where do you like to study? And divides the class in teams of three or four players. Each team of three has player A, B, and C. If you have a team of four, then you have players A, B, C, and D. During the practice round, teammates share information about themselves, preparing for the next round, they don't know the questions the teacher has prepared, so they try to predict the questions that the teacher will be asking. So they talk about themselves. Sometimes I might give them a hint. I can say, okay, the questions will be about media, vacation, and leisure activities. The teacher asks question one about player A from each team. So for example, what is players A favorite dessert? Players A write down the answer without showing it to the rest of the class, while their teammates discuss possible answers and each team provides their answer about their player A. If their answer is the same as the answer that player A wrote down, then they earn a point. The next round is question two about player B. Where was player B born? And the same procedure. Question three will be about player C. So the principle is that they try to write the same answers as their players. Sometimes I repeat the same question, but ask it about a different player. For example, where was player C born? Okay. Um, and um, because if I think it's a good question, it actually is related to the topic. Uh, we just learned the structure. I would repeat the question three times if I have three players. And I use three lifelines here because sometimes the play, uh, players don't understand the question. So there might be a player who is not prepared and they don't understand the question or they might need help with the answer. So they're allowed to have three lifelines and all three of them ask the teacher in this particular game. Uh, so the practice round, as I said, is very important. The students talk to each other and they try to learn as much as they can about their teammates. Even lower proficiency level students can play this game you just have to ask simple basic questions such as where does player a live does he have a brother does he like coffee etc after the practice round students again have the question round and then they they comparing the answers the team with the most points wins so more tips about the game what happens when a team has no more lifelines left, but their contestant doesn't understand the question? I don't want the student and their team to stop playing because of that, so they're allowed to ask for help, but they lose one point, minus one point penalty. The contestant needs to ask in the target language um, and needs to ask for help. For example, um, could you help me please? I don't understand this word. What does that mean? So in general, some easy questions are worth one point and the team earns one point if they guess. But harder questions are worth two or three points. So theoretically, some um, uh, teams, you know, even if they lose one point, they can still earn one or two or three points. So it's still worth it. But what matters to me is that everybody keeps playing 
keeps writing, keeps listening, and keeps talking to each other. I don't want players just sitting there because they're out, because that actually is not the goal of this activity, right? I want them to, I want them to practice and practice and practice the language. The last game I will present today I call Survey Says. It's the famous catchphrase from the popular game show The Family Feud. The game is inspired by the, game, uh, by the show, but I have changed the rules. I prepare a list of questions in advance, and I use one of the inter interactive PowerPoint templates. For answers, I use class surveys that I have conducted online throughout the semester. I make or I make up my own answers, or I use online surveys. So, for example, if you Google Family Feud questions and answers, you'll find tons of ideas online. Then you just have to translate them and decide which, one are, which ones are appropriate. Then divide the class in groups of three or four. Contestants are challenged to come up with the most popular answers to each question, which are placed on the game board and revealed after the teams provide their answers. The teacher, as the game master, reads the first question and teams have a limited time to answer the question. They get together, make a decision, write the answer or orally report it. All teams show their written answers simultaneously, usually at the end. The teacher reveals the answers on the board after all teams have answered. If an answer is not on the board, the team gets zero points for the first three times, three strikes. After the first three strikes, the team loses five points for each uh, answer that is not on the board. Let me show you some of my questions and answers. Here is an example. What is your favorite place on campus, according to the results of a class survey? If students answered Memorial Union, they got 50 points, Starbucks 40 points, Library 30 points, I don't have any 20 points. Another example, where does Madame Barchevanova grade your homework? Name two places. In this case, I combine the points for both places. Or name two beverages some French people drink with breakfast. This question was inspired by a short reading that the class has done the previous uh, week. I also use this for cultural topics. For example, name three of the largest francophone cities, according to Wikipedia. If they answer Kinshasa, they'll get 10 points, Paris, 8 points, and so on. This is an excellent game for culture, especially geography, famous people, but you can also do it for practicing vocabulary and a lot of like cultural trivia. Congratulations, you finished the presentation and you earned a badge. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you will find some of my ideas and suggestions helpful and you'll be able to use them in your classrooms. Remember, take fun seriously and don't let a good game go to waste.